Hello to chapter 91 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville and this chapter is titled The Peacod Meets the Rosebud. In vain it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan insufferable fetor denying not inquiry. Sir T. Brown V. E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory midday sea, that the many noses on the peacock's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft, a peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. I will bet something now, said Stubb, that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long. Presently the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betokened that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture sea fowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale, that is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea and so floated an unappropriated corpse. It may well be conceived what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality and by no means of the nature of attar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in the proper place we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general. The peacock had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. There's a pretty fellow now, he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. There's a jackal for ye, I well know that these crapos of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm whale spouts, yes, and sometimes sailing from their port with their hold full of boxes of tallow, candles and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into eye, we all know these things, but look ye, there's a crapo that is content with our leavings, the drugged whale there, I mean, aye, and is content too with scraping the bo dry bones of that other precious fish he has there. Poor devil, I say pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he'll get from that drugged whale there wouldn't be fit to burn in a jail, no, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours. Then he'll get from that bundle of bones. Though, now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil, yes, ambergris. 
I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter-deck. By this time, the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no the peacock was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stop now called his boat's crew and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk. It was painted green and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red color. Upon her head, Boards. In large gilt letters he read Bouton de Rose, Rose Button, or Rose Bud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stop did not understand the Bouton part of the inscription, yet the word Rose and the bulbous figure had put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rose bud, eh? he cried with his hand to his nose. That will do very well. But how, like all creation, it smells! Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side and thus come close to the blasted whale and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, Bouton the Rose, ahoy! Are there any of you Bouton the Roses that speak English? Yes, rejoined a Guernsey, men from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, my Bouton the Rose, but have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale, a sperm whale. Moby Dick, have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cachalot Blanche, white whale, no. Very good then, goodbye now and I'll call again in a minute. Then, rapidly pulling back towards the peacock and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarter-deck rail, awaiting his report, he moulded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, No, sir, no! Upon which Ahab retired and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man who had just got into the chains and was using a cutting spade had slung his nose in a sort of bag. What's the matter with your nose there? said Stubb. Broke it? I wish it was broken or that I didn't have any nose at all, answered the Guernsey man who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. But what are you holding yours for? Oh, nothing. It's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. Fine day, ain't it? Eh, rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of po posies, will ye, put on the rose? What in the devil's name do you want here? roared the Guernsey man, flying into a sudden passion. Oh, keep cool, cool, yes, that's the word. Why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at them? But joking aside, though, you know... Rosebud, that's it all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales. As for that dried up one, there, he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass. I know that well enough, but you see the captain here won't believe it. This is his first voyage. He was a cologne manufacturer before. But come on board, and may I he'll believe you, if you won't, me, and so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige ye, my sweet and pleasant fellow, rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck. There a queer scene presented itself. The sailors in tasseled caps of red worsted were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whale. But they worked rather slow and talked very fast and seemed in anything but a good humour. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jabooms. Now and then pairs of them would drop their work and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air. 
some thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum in coal tar and at intervals had it, held it to their nostrils. Others, having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's round house abaft and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's round house cabinet he called it, to avoid the pest, but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Making all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme and, returning to the Guernsey man, had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him, so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circ circumventing and satirizing the captain without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased but as coming from Stubb, and as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. And I'll have to stop now because I have to leave for work. Bye-bye till next time with the second part of this chapter.